Hey there, I'm Drew, and you are listening to or watching The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that covers all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and anxiety recovery. So if you're struggling with things like panic attacks, agoraphobia, or health anxiety, well, this is the place for you, and I'm happy you're here. This week on the podcast, we're going to talk about the difference between reassurance seeking, which is not a good thing in recovery, and productive assurance seeking, which is. What's the difference? Why does it matter? And how can we break the cycle of repetitive reassurance seeking? Let's get into that now. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 241. We are recording in January of 2023. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm glad you found us. If you've been here for years, welcome back. I'm glad all of you guys are here. So today, as I mentioned in the intro, we are going to talk about the idea of unproductive, cyclical, never-ending reassurance seeking and why that's a bad thing. We're going to talk about productive assurance seeking, which is a good thing, especially in the early stages of your anxiety journey. And we're going to look at some ways that you can start to change or break that never-ending cycle of repetitive reassurance seeking. But before we get into it, I'm going to direct you guys over to my website at theanxioustruth.com because The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode there's a bunch of other free podcast episodes. There's a ton of free social media content. There's a monthly webinar on distress tolerance that I do with Joanna Hardis. There are my three books that I've written about anxiety and anxiety recovery, which are being read by tens of thousands of people around the world. And I'm really proud of how many people those books are helping. That can all be found on my website at theanxioustruth.com. So don't stop here. Go over to the website and avail yourself of all the goodies. They're all there. Take advantage of them any way that you can. And if you're digging my work and it's helping you in some ways, all the ways to support it can be found on my website at theanxioustruth.com slash support. Financial support is always appreciated, but never required. I appreciate all of you guys and any way you support the work, whether it's just listening to a podcast episode, write, reading, or writing a review, or liking a YouTube video. Thank you very much. I appreciate it in a big way. So let's get into today's topic, and that is the never-ending, unproductive cycle of constant reassurance-seeking it often is part and parcel of an anxiety disorder and stands in the way of recovery. So why do why does that happen? What is it? And why is it a problem? But before we get into that, I want to talk about the difference between unproductive, maladaptive, reassurance seeking that never ends and productive assurance seeking, because there is a difference between assurance and reassurance. And it's quite literal based on the nature of the words. Reassurance, meaning a thing that you keep doing again and again and again, reassurance. But in the beginning of anybody's anxiety journey, the availability of assurance, we would call it education, good information, helping somebody understand, is a positive thing. We not only want that, but we kind of need it in the early stages. So if you're new to all this, and you do not understand what's happening to you, why this is happening, or what you're supposed to do about it, then seeking assurance and productive, helpful information that helps you understand what this is and understand that you are going to be okay and you can be okay and how you get to be okay is really important. In fact, if you walked into a therapist's office, the early, start, the early stages of therapy for an anxiety disorder would involve a lot of what we call psychoeducation. And much of psychoeducation is just providing you with information that assures you that we know what this is and it's going to be okay. Everybody needs that. That is not a problem. And sometimes, and this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, and I understand social media is certainly not perfect, but the word reassurance gets thrown around so much in the anxiety community, especially in the OCD community and social media, that often when people ask questions, they are immediately shut down and told, that's reassurance seeking. We're not answering that question. Go away. And sometimes that is the correct answer, correct in air quotes, if you will. But sometimes it is not because if this person is new on their journey and doesn't understand what's going on and has never asked those questions before, they should ask those questions and those questions should be answered. So before, if you're listening to me now and you are active in social media circles in this community, before you immediately shut somebody down that you don't know by telling them you're seeking reassurance, stop that, you might want to find out where they are in their journey. Because as I just mentioned, productive assurance seeking is an important part of the educational process that forms the foundation of recovery. So we cannot just automatically tell everybody that they're seeking reassurance. 
That is not true. So there is nuance and there is context there, and it's important to recognize. So if you see somebody asking questions and you think they shouldn't be asking, unless you really understand their situation, you might want to just let it go and see if somebody else can answer the question. It would be better for them to not get an answer than to get shut down inappropriately, if you will. So that little rant over, we want to talk about when productive assurance seeking at the beginning of the process begins to go off the rails. You know it's starting to go off the rails when it's a thing that you begin to do again and again and again. So if somebody like me tells you, oh, what you're having is panic attacks, they're not dangerous, they're really scary, and you've learned to be afraid of them, and now this is why you're having a hard time leaving your house and driving and doing all the things where you think panic might be triggered. When we tell you that, and you say, yeah, but it feels like I'm going to die, and we say, well, you won't die. I know it feels really scary, but nobody dies from a panic attack. After you've been told that, for example, I know that's not the only fear, insert your fear here, but for example, once you've been told that 10 times at the beginning of the journey, you will start to recognize that you keep asking that again and again and again, or your fear begins to shift. Well, okay, I'm not so much worried about dying now, but now I feel like I'm worried about going crazy. Then you start to ask about that again and again and again. What, will I have a psychotic break? Or you might, to ask, you might start to ask, will I pass out? Or you might start to worry that people will judge you, or you will be embarrassed or ashamed during a panic attack, and you'll begin to try to seek reassurance about that. So either the single fear stays, and you just keep asking again and again and again to have that question answered, to have your fear soothed and taken away temporarily, or you'll find that the fear theme begins to shift and you find yourself asking about different themes again and again and again until it shifts to the next one and you're back in the cycle. So let's acknowledge for a second that the idea of being given reassurance seems to make, from a human standpoint, common sense. It seems to make sense. Put yourself in a position where there's a human being standing in front of you, they are in a state of distress, and they are asking you to take that away from them or soothe them and make them feel better. Well, from a person's standpoint, just a human, a kindness standpoint, common sense would say, well, I'm going to try and make this person feel better. I need to fix this for them. They're asking me to tell them that it's going to be okay, and so I'll tell them. Why wouldn't you tell them? I get that. So that's one of the insidious things about the unproductive cycle of continual reassurance seeking is that at face value, giving somebody reassurance that everything's going to be okay seems like a very kind thing to do. And in, in a non-disordered state, in regular life, if you will, more air quotes, regular life, everybody needs to hear that it's going to be okay. Every human being once in a while in life needs to be told it's going to be okay. I know the shit is hitting the fan, but it's going to be okay. And we need to hear that. We like it. It makes us feel better. And it helps us get on firm footing again. I get that. Our support people will tell us it's going to be okay. So we have to be mindful of the fact that basic human kindness, and especially if you're more prone to be a helper or a fixer or a supporter, means that you may feed into somebody's reassurance cycle. And for the suffering person, it makes perfect sense to them to keep asking again and again and again because they want to feel better right then and there in that moment. So acknowledge assurance, good. Now we're moving into reassurance where it starts to become pervasive and never ending and it's never enough and the questions never stop. Now we recognize that. Now we can recognize that answering the questions makes sense from the helper standpoint because common sense says you help a person who wants to be told it's going to be okay. And from the sufferer side, it makes sense to keep asking because when they tell me it's going to be okay, I feel better. Except I feel better for a week, then I feel better for a few days, then it only lasts a day, then it starts to only last a couple of hours before I'm asking again. And if you are suffering from these type of problems that I talked about in this podcast, you might be familiar with that, where that the, the length of time that that reassurance has effect begins to shrink, get smaller and smaller and smaller, till you find yourself asking over and over and over in rapid succession. So that's when you start to see like, wait a minute, this, this common sense thing that's designed to make me feel better when I need to feel better is going off the rails. And on the other side, from the helper or supporter standpoint, you start to realize something's not right here because I'm being asked this question again and again and again, and it doesn't seem to be sticking. And you wonder. Because in plain old life, if you will, well, when we tell somebody, hey, listen, they're really struggling, maybe they're having a hard time with work, or they just broke up with a partner, like, it's going to be okay. And in the end, they get that and they move on. They don't ask you again and again and again. 
But here we're in a situation where, oh, you know, the rules get flipped over, the table gets turned over, nothing makes sense anymore. And how come they don't believe me? I just told them this 10 times last week, and now they're asking me again. Oops, sorry about that. Um, notification sounds. And then from the sufferer standpoint, you understand in a moment of calmness, wait a minute, why do we keep asking the same questions again and again and again? Why can't my brain believe this? But so you recognize the repetitive cycle that you're stuck in. But then when the shit hits the fan and you're really afraid because you're panicking or you have a big anxiety spike or that intrusive thought pops in that you hate and you fear so much in that moment, the cycle be damned. I'm going to ask again and I will demand that you make me feel better right now by giving me reassurance again. So why does this become problematic? Why is it a thing that we really should be trying to break? Why is it a habit that we need to get over and get away from? Because it seems like common sense to soothe your fear immediately when it pops up. But here's the problem. If you do that, first of all, you will discover quickly that it becomes incredibly repetitive, that there's never enough an anxiety disorder will take as much reassurance as you can give it, and then it will ask for more and more and more, and it will never end. So I think if you're listening to this podcast and you've been dealing with this stuff long enough, you recognize this. I can't stop doing it. It never ends, and it's never, ever enough. The themes shift, the, question, the questions change, and then I ask that question for three weeks, then I ask another question for four weeks. It never ends. Recognize that what this is, constant reassurance-seeking, as opposed to productive assurance at the beginning of the, re the, the process, constant unproductive maladaptive reassurance seeking is a coping strategy. You are in distress and I, you want to feel better immediately in that moment. And the coping strategy that you decide to use is to ask something outside of you, a, a partner, a friend, a family member, a significant other, your Facebook support group, an internet forum, Google, doesn't matter. It's something outside your own skin. I will go to something outside my own skin to tell me that I'm going to be okay and assure me again, reassure again, re, re, reassure that I'm going to be okay. So it is a coping strategy that we develop to ease that sense of distress in the moment. And maybe it lasts. In the beginning, it might last for a week or two or a month. But then suddenly you find yourself where it lasts for maybe an hour some days on the hard days, it doesn't even last for an hour. And then you're back at it again and again and again. And you're consumed by this question all day long and this, this fear all day long. So it's a coping strategy, but is a temporary coping strategy. It's sort of a common sense thing that we think we should do feel better. And it goes off the rails and it just, it doesn't work. It only works very temporarily. So why is that a problem? People will say, well, what's wrong with that? Why can't I just be told every day that I'm going to be okay? And then I'll get on with my life. Ah, but you can't get on with your life. And you probably have seen this if you're listening to this podcast. Why can't you get on with your life? Because no amount of reassurance will ever be enough. So you'll just keep asking more and more and more and more and more often. And you'll ask different questions and they'll just keep coming. You guys know this. If you're listening, you're probably in the thick of this right now. And sometimes that becomes really disruptive when it comes to relationships you start to be at odds with your online support people. You start to be at odds with your therapist. You start to be at odds with your partner and your family and your BFF. They start to become worn down by these questions that get asked again and again and again. Then emotions get raw because they're feeling sort of worn down and you're feeling like they've, they're abandoning you. Nobody's supporting me. They don't understand. So it is not a practical strategy to say, I will just live the rest of my life asking anybody around me if I'm going to be okay anytime I get scared, and that's how I'll do this. That doesn't work because we cannot maintain the semblance of like a normal life without this disrupting it in a big way. It's really important to understand that. So the issue is that you, if you do it that way and you use that as your go-to default coping strategy, you never actually learn a core lesson of recovery, which is I'm really afraid I'm in a state of distress, but I can navigate through that myself. I can get through this. If I don't fight it, if I learn to surf through it, I will come out the other side and I will see experientially the best way to learn through my own experience and not through the words of other people, me included, Drew included. The best way for me to learn that I'm okay is to see and experience that I am okay. I'm uncomfortable. I'm afraid. I feel the stress. I feel uncertain. But in the end, I wind up okay. I'm still standing. I'm still here. I did it. And if you immediately run to external sources to soothe your discomfort and your distress with their words or Google search, every time you get worked up, 
You never learn that lesson. You never learn it. That's important. So that's why it's so important to start to break the habit of constant reassurance seeking. We need those lessons. That is difficult. Why is it difficult? Because like I just said, it's really counterintuitive. The common sense thing is I feel really bad. Make me feel better now. Soothe me now. Give me words now. I need it now. And from the helper standpoint, I mean, even sometimes professional qualified trained helpers can get trapped in that. We're human beings. We want to help each other. And so it can be really hard to break what seems like a very kind, compassionate, caring habit that really turned into an enabling habit over time. It's making things worse. So it's hard to go against your sense of kindness and compassion if you're a helper. And it's hard to go against your sense of, I need to feel better right now if you're the sufferer. So what direction do you want to start to face? The way I would look at this, and I will look at it from the helper or the supporter standpoint. So if you're the person stuck in this situation where you're asking every day because you're always afraid, put yourself in the position of a helper, somebody that loves you. Forget your therapist, forget a doctor. It's just a helper, your friend, your partner, your mom, your whatever. The best conversation to have with that person to start to change direction and begin to break the habit of reassurance seeking would be for that person to tell you, I know that right now you are terrified and in distress and feeling uncertain and vulnerable and like something bad is about to happen. But it has never happened. Your anxious brain has always been wrong. And I know you want so badly for me to tell you you're going to be okay, but I know that I can cheer for you and stand by you while you learn that for yourself without my words. That is a powerful shift. That is a very powerful shift. So if you want to ask again and again and again, if you will go crazy or have a psychotic break when your anxiety level gets too high, the, an the best answer, and this is an answer I tend to give people online once I know that they've been down this road over and over, is I will say, I know what you want me to tell you, but I, would, I know that you can learn this by yourself. You can go through this. You can tolerate this. You can navigate through this, and you can prop yourself up. You don't need me to use my words to soothe your fear again, because then you don't learn any lessons. So I think it's really important to understand that maybe the people around you want to help you, but the best way they can begin to help you would be to encourage you and cheer for you and remind you of your strength and your power while you don't get that reassurance and you have to navigate through the choppy waters on your own. Now, if you are the person asking the question, in those moments where you feel like, I can't keep doing this, I have to stop this, it is a reasonable conversation to have with your support people. I'm going to make a deal with you. The next time I ask you again if I'm going crazy or if my skin looks weird or if I look like I'm okay, I don't want you to answer me. I want you to remind me what I'm doing. You're seeking that reassurance again. I have. Please tell me that you know that I can do this on my own. That's a reasonable way to set the table because in the end, we get reassurance from our friends, from our families, from our partners. We get reassurance on the internet sometimes. So in a calmer moment, you may have to make a deal with yourself. I will not go to my Facebook. I mean, I have a big Facebook group full of people that are suffering from these problems. Like if you're in the group, you know that there's not a lot of reassurance seeking because people begin to understand like, well, I'm not really going to get it here in this group. So you start to understand, well, I'm going to go over there and say like, hey, guys, listen, I'm really afraid right now. Somebody just remind me that I can do this. That is, that is a great use of your support system, be it online or in person, as opposed to can somebody, I feel like I'm going to die. No, I'm really struggling right now. I'm really afraid again. Can somebody please remind me that I can do this, that I'm capable? That's a great way to start to change that. You still can access support and encouragement and people that will cheer for you because they care for you, but you, you also learn to go through it yourself without asking them to take away your discomfort or soothe your fear. That is not easy. It is not easy. And you will mess up sometimes. That's okay. In a moment of weakness and fear, which is okay. Everybody goes through that. You will make a mistake if you will and ask for reassurance. That's okay. But one thing I would say that's important to remember as you begin to break the cycle, and I'm going to wrap this up here because I think I've rambled enough, but as you begin to work to break the cycle of continual repetitive reassurance seeking, remember that this is an emotional thing. So often when you get into that really difficult moment and you forget and you, and you want to be soothed and reassured in that moment, and somebody knows the deal they've made with you and they understand what you're doing and they're trying to help you in the most productive way possible and they 
kindly and compassionately refuse to do that, instead want to root for you to go through it yourself. It is very common in the, the most uncomfortable moments to get angry and feel abandoned and lash out. All I want is, why can't you just, nobody's understanding, nobody supports me, No, I'm not getting any support anymore. Understand that that's going to happen sometimes. So if you are the sufferer, recognize when that's happening. It's going to happen sometimes because this gets so emotional if I'm feeling so afraid and like I'm in such danger and I just want you to help me and you step away from me instead of toward me, man, I might get really angry at that in a moment of distress. That's going to happen. And if you're supporting people who have this problem, recognize that they're going to get really angry and they might lash out at you and accuse you of being unsupportive and abandoning them. In that moment, it's so important. The helpers do play a role. Like, listen, I know you're really angry with me. Let's talk about this again in 15 minutes because I know you can get through those 15 minutes. Then we'll talk about this. Difficult. It's going to get a little messy. It's going to get emotional. There's going to be tempers. There's going to be, you know, accusations. There's probably going to be all of those things. Just expect that. And know that like, okay, nobody's abandoning anybody. Nobody's being cruel to anybody. As long as the parameters are known, and these are conversations that have been had, and you recognize the mechanisms at play, then you can get through this. You can get through the moments of distress, and you can get through the breaking of the habit of constant reassurance seeking. And believe me, it is hard work, but it is worth doing because when you begin to be able to stand on your own, you find that you're not asking anymore. And you just know, I don't have to ask because I know I'm going to be okay because I've seen it so many times and I can do this. You start to feel competent. You start to feel powerful. You start to feel in control again. And believe it or not, this can really improve your relationship with the people that are important to you. Sometimes it improves your relationship either with your therapist or your doctor, with your support group. Like even those relationships can be improved when you come to it standing a little bit more on your own two feet. And people are happy for you because they can see you starting to feel your own power and understand, oh, I have, I have a say in this, man, I can do this. So that is assurance, good thing. So not every question is reassurance seeking. Sometimes it's productive assurance seeking. There's nothing wrong with that. We got to accommodate that. We want that. Then there's the cycle that never ends that gets us stuck and sort of stands in the way of the critical lessons of recovery. And then there's how we can start to break that by recognizing I got to make different deals with my support structures here and I have to make a different deal with myself and I have to be willing to navigate through this uncertainty and this distress and discomfort on my own a few times to start to learn from that. And that is, in a nutshell, that's the whole idea of reassurance and why it's bad, why we got to break in and why productive assurance is a good thing. So I think I've said enough words on this. It went longer than I thought. What a surprise. My podcast went longer than I thought it would. That never happens, right? If you've been listening to me long enough, you know that that is, I should just stop saying that they're going to be short because they are so rarely short. All right, 25 minutes. We are done. You know it's over because music. That is Afterglow by my friend Ben Drake, who wrote this song inspired at least in part by this podcast several years ago and has been kind enough to let me use it at the beginning of most episodes, the end of every one for the past several years. So if you want to know more about Ben and that song, if you've grown accustomed to it, go to his website at bendrakemusic.com. If you are listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or some platform that has a rating and a review system, leave a five-star rating. If you're digging the podcast, then maybe take a minute and write a review because that helps more people find the podcast and then we get to help more people, which is why I started talking into this microphone in 2014 to begin with. And if you're watching on YouTube, then like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know every time I upload new content. And leave a comment. I promise every week or so I circle back through YouTube and I do answer the comments there. I really like you guys and the the interaction over there. So I promise I'll get back to you. I really will. Uh, And that's it. Hopefully this has been helpful to you. Leave a comment. Leave a question. We'll talk about it some more. Um, I think I'm done. I have nothing else to say to you guys. You know that I'll be back next week with another podcast episode. I will not. I do not know what I'm going to talk about then. Oh, I actually do know what I'm going to talk about then. Because it's not going to be just me. I have some special guests next week on the podcast that you will recognize. I'm super excited about it. In fact, we're recording it later. But for now, I'm out. That's the end of episode 241. And remember, as always, this is the way. You know you'll never get another chance to go and live your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Push through the pressure like an atom bomb. You keep on dancing like it's your last song. Makes no difference if you're right or wrong.